Good afternoon, everyone. May I have your attention, please? Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, General Thomas Bostic, who is a 1978 graduate of the U.S. Military Academy and who also holds a Master's of Science degree in both civil engineering and mechanical engineering from Stanford University. He is currently the U.S. Army's 53rd Chief of Engineers and Command General of the United States Army Corps of Engineers, responsible for most of the nation's civil works, infrastructure, and military construction. Uh, he deployed with the division uh, in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom before commanding the Army Corps of Engineers Gulf Region Division, where he was responsible for over $18 billion in, con in reconstruction in Iraq. Uh, Lieutenant General Bostic also served as an associate professor of mechanical engineering at West Point and was a White House fellow serving as a special assistant to the Secretary of Veterans Affairs. Please welcome our speaker. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that kind introduction, Alex. It's a great honor for me to be here. I wanted to just recognize the Dean. Joe, thank you for being here and, and for your great leadership of uh, the Thayer uh, Engineering uh, curriculum here and the, the, the whole uh, school. It, it, it was a great conversation that we had before we came in. I also had a great conversation with some of the PhD students. I wanted to recognize some of the, the folks that work real closely with this school, and that's the Coal Regions Research Laboratory employees. So if you'll, for the scientists, engineers, and all that come from Crowell, can you raise your hand so folks, yeah, all right, so if they're hard questions, they, they will be able to answer that. <laughs> Um, now, uh, as you heard, I, I graduated from West Point. I, I taught engineering at West Point. Uh, since the students at West Point were really soldiers, they were cadets, but they had already sworn oath, um, I could give them orders if they fell asleep or did anything like that. So, so Dean, I'm not sure what I do here, uh, you know, in terms of, I know I can't give civilian orders, but I'm, I'm, it's really delightful for me to be here and, and be at a great educational institution such as Dartmouth. My uh, wife is an elementary school principal. Uh, I don't think she knows where I'm at today, but I'm going to tell her that I was at Dartmouth. She'll be very excited that I'm working with uh, great uh, men and women and, and the educators who are interested in the future uh, of this country, because she's been doing that for as long as I've been in the Army. And one of my uh, favorite uh, people in life is a person named Frances Hesselbein, and she helps the Army out quite a bit. And in leadership, but uh, she earned the Presidential Medal of Freedom uh, from President Clinton in the White House. And one of the things that uh, she often says is that there are two institutions uh, in America that have sustained our democracy uh, since the beginning of our country, and, and that's the United States Army and education. And, and you all are involved in the education of our youth, public education, private education, but the education of our youth. And, and we kind of work hand in hand. The Army and education is what is the foundation of this country, the freedoms that we all enjoy. So I want to thank you for, one, those students that are involved in, in pursuing higher level education, and certainly for the faculty and all those that are in administration for the work that you do. You could be out doing a lot of different things, but you chose a noble profession, and, and we'd like to think that we work hand in hand in, in, in securing the freedoms of this great country. Um, I'm going to talk about a number of different things, but I thought I'd start off by talking about, um, and I hit this, um, how many know the association of Sylvanius Thayer with West Point? Just uh, Okay, quite a few, quite a few. I did not know the, the association of Sylvanius Thayer with Dartmouth uh, until I started getting ready for this. And, you know, I'm going to go back and I'm going to talk to my boss, who's the chief staff of the Army, General Odierno great combat veteran, and, and he's a West Point graduate as well. And I'm sure he and others will be delighted to hear the great history of Thayer. You know, last uh, week was one of these weeks where it just, it was hard. I, I think I gave speeches twice a day. I was up on Congress. I was in w the White House at OMB. And at the end of the week, I was just completely pooped. I had a social event every night. And I sat down with my staff and I said, uh, you know, this has been a Thayer week. You know, do, do you all say that? Because, <laughs> you, 
and I've been doing that ever since I was a cadet, but, you know, Thayer really tested us. You know, he put in the kind of systems at West Point that really demanded the best out of everybody, and you had to deliver. But when you finished, you felt pretty good, and you kind of, in jest, you said, you know, it was a fair week today, and you kind of felt real good about what you did. Um, he, as you know, he, he graduated from Dartmouth. He was valedictorian. Uh, and then he went to West Point, and he graduated from West Point in one year. Um, and then um, the president, President Madison, sent him uh, to France, and he wanted him to go to France and learn about the French military and learn about uh, books, what they were reading, what they were studying about war and politics, and, and to bring some of that back to West Point. So at West Point, which was kind of a loosely held school, you know, with loose standards and, and that sort of thing, it's hard for me to imagine even saying that today, you know, but somewhere along the line, we were very loosey-goosey at West Point, and fair who graduated from this great institution, came to West Point armed with what he learned from France, and he really bucked up the system. I mean, he, he started entrance exams. Uh, uh, he had two exams a year. Uh, he focused on individual learning. Uh, and, and a lot of that individual learning was you had to get up and speak. You had to, you had to demonstrate knowledge. You got tested every day. We have things called boards. Uh, I don't know if they ever did that here, but, but we had to take boards every day where you'd physically go up and you'd have your section of the board and you'd have to wax eloquently on that board uh, showing that you knew what you were doing. And, uh, and that hasn't changed. In fact, I, I went back to West Point uh, to teach. In, in the summer before I started, they, they had what they called beast, in, instructor beast. Now, the cadets, when they come through West Point, they go through what's called beast barracks. And it's really tough, and, and, and it's not demeaning, but it's, you feel like you're being demeaned, and it's very difficult. And when you come back to teach in the bar, department I was in, it was called Instructor Beast. So you had, to, you had to take three courses at the same time the cadets would take one. You had to take every exam in a third of the time the cadets would take it, and it was just a, a real drill. And then they had us teach classes. Well, the, the instructors in our department were well known for using five different kind of colors of chalk. And uh, do they do that here? Yeah, but, 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 but five colors of chalk. And I was so nervous. The first, you know, I'm a captain, you know, I've been doing all this, but I'm still nervous. So I, I got to the board and I was doing something on the first board. Then I got to the second board and I was doing something on the third board. And I got uh, to the third board and finally the head of the department with all the instructors that were sitting there making sure that I knew how to teach said, Captain Bostic do you really need 15 colors of chalk in your hand at one time? <laughs> and I looked down and I said, no, you're right. <laughs> so, uh, but but th this whole way of teaching that Thayer brought to West Point still resides in what we do today. So we thank Dartmouth. We, we thank uh, you all for uh, sending him uh, to us years ago. And, uh, and, and now we know we have a great tradition. Uh, the... Uh, when Thayer left, he actually left uh, after 16 years as the superintendent of West Point. And he and Andrew Jackson didn't get along, so, so he left West Point. He, stayed, he went back to the Corps of Engineers, my branch, and he stayed there until about 1867. And at that time, he, he took $30,000 and he donated it to Dartmouth and suggested that they start this Thayer School of Engineering and recommended that they pick a young Army engineer to lead it. So just before I got in here, I was trying to figure out, well, did Dartmouth listen? Well, they, they picked a second lieutenant that taught math out of West Point. His name was Robert Fletcher. So he was the first one. He was the, the director and the dean, and he had three students. Uh, so look how this has blossomed and grown. So you all ought to be real proud of uh, your, 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 the father of this uh, great engineering institution and what he's done. And I can tell you we're real proud of what he's done for West Point. Um, the Corps of Engineers. Uh, how many have heard of the Corps of Engineers? Yeah, okay, good, good. There's a few of you that haven't. <laughs> okay. Hey, uh, uh, there's a lot of things you, I bet you don't know about the Corps of Engineers, and, and I'm going to show you a couple of things today. Maybe you know most of this, but let's go through uh, what the Corps does. So, so first, um, the Corps is really known for its water resource management. We, we've been around for as long as the Army's been around. The Army was born on uh, 14 June 1775, and on 16 June 1775, they created uh, the, the engineer branch and the Corps of Engineers. And since that time, we've done a number of things for this country. You can see in the center screen there, on the top, the U.S. Capitol 
uh, dome. Um, it's getting ready to go under renovation, but the Corps of Engineers built that. The Washington Monument, the Corps of Engineers built that, and the Lincoln Memorial, and many other memorials, things like the Library of Congress, uh, the old Executive Office building now, the Eisenhower Executive Office building right next to the White House, those sorts of things. In fact, the whole layout of, of, uh, of Washington, D.C. was done by an engineer named LaFont, um, who, who had a French background, brought that to the United States and designed that city in a very symmetrical way. And I think if you've been to Washington and flown over it, you'll see everything. You know, if you looked at, uh, in the, the direction here, you'll see the White House is symmetrical with the Jefferson Memorial. But all of that was set up with a great symmetry of an engineer mind, uh, Pierre Lafont. Uh, the Bonneville Dam, uh, we do about 25% of the nation's hydropower is done by the Corps of Engineers. I don't know how many folks knew that. I, I didn't know it until I took this job, but a lot of the hydropower of this country comes from the Corps of Engineers. We have uh, some public-private partnerships that, that help us provide that hydropower, but it's a huge uh, boon to the country to have the Corps help to operate that. When the French couldn't finish the Panama Canal, uh, a great combat engineer went in there, a Corps of Engineer officer, and, and finished the Panama Canal. We did the NASA Space Center. Um, the, the Pentagon up there uh, was constructed uh, by the Corps of Engineers in 16 months. Any idea how long it took to renovate it? <laughs> 16 years. <laughs> the Corps didn't do that. But uh, anyway, it did, you know, and, and it, it kind of tells you about our society uh, and what, what's changed. What do you think's changed that's taken us 16 years to do something we built? It, it's always harder to renovate, but what kind of things have changed? Yeah, yeah, there's all kinds of bureaucracy. How much risk do we take? Yeah, not a lot. And I, you know, why don't we take as much risk? Any lawyers in the room? <laughs> My sister's a lawyer, so I like lawyers. But you get, you get sued a lot. I'm, I'm probably being sued three or four times today as I speak. You know, the law... No, I'm serious. We get, we get sued a lot. <laughs> I mean, uh, so, so it causes some risk aversion. What else has changed? Our desire on environmental, uh, you know, we, think, we didn't care about the environment in the past, but all of that's changed. You know, every day I wake up, uh, I go out, I learn something new about the Corps. I went to Crowell, I learned all kinds of things about what this great organization, our lab here, is doing for the nation. And they're doing it in every spectrum of what the military and civilian scientists and engineers, engineers could be involved in. You know, one day, uh, it was mentioned, Alex mentioned I was a White House Fellow, and the White House Fellows uh, had this Saturday event, and they said, would you come down to the Smithsonian and take a tour of the National Museum, Museum of Natural History? I said, no, I've been there about ten times, and I, I, I'm good. Uh, and they said, no, we'd really like you to come. And uh, I said, really? And uh, so anyway, I went down there, and uh, we walked around, saw all the dinosaurs, and, and um and then we sat down for lunch, and, and they said, you're probably wondering why we had you here. And they had the president of the Smithsonian. They had uh, David Rubenstein, a big investor, and a lot of other folks. And I, I said, yeah, I was kind of wondering. You know, I was planning on going on a long run today, this being Saturday and everything, but I appreciate the private tour. And, uh, and they said, well, we like your Tyrannosaurus Rex. I said, well, you know, I had a good supply when I was a kid, but I gave up all those Tyrannosaurus Rex. I really have no Tyrannosaurus Rex. He said, no, you have one of the complete, most complete Tyrannosaurus Rex in the world. I said, I do? Uh, so I went back to my office and I said, hey, where's it at? Where's it hiding? <laughs> and uh, and we, our guys didn't know initially. Then we checked and we have, you know, we have 45 districts. We have in nine divisions. We have seven labs. We're in 130 different countries. So sometimes it's hard to keep up with the Tyrannosaurus Rex and where it might be. <laughs> but uh, it turned out that it was in Montana in a museum up there. And it belonged to one of my divisions, one of my nine divisions. And, um, and we made an agreement to, to bring this down uh, to the Smithsonian for 50 years. So that it's like 95% complete. The ones in the Smithsonian are mostly plaster and plastic. They're, they're not real. They look real. But, uh, but this T-Rex is the real deal. And we have two of them, in fact. And um, it was supposed to go on the, the mall, at the, the National Mall, what you see right there between the Washington Monument, uh, there in the Capitol. It was going to go on the National Mall. Um, it, it wasn't going to physically go. We were going to have a big event there on 16 October, uh, National Fossil Day. You probably didn't know it was National Fossil Day. <laughs> but uh, National Fossil Day was on the 16th of October. But you may know that we had uh, government shutdown. 
so guess where T-Rex is? <laughs> still, still up there, but uh, we're going to bring it down. We're going to have a, an event in the fall. But uh, so hopefully, you know, this gives you an idea of, gosh, the core does a lot of different things. Now, this is just a snapshot of what we do, but I'm going to talk about a, a few more, but I wanted you to give, a, give you a feel. Uh, how many think we're mostly Army or mostly civilian? How, how many say mostly Army guys? We're in this uniform. Large percentage Army. How many say mostly Army? Give a few hands. 50-50? Um, how many think we're 50-50? Yeah, a few hands there. We're, we have 37,000 employees in 700 wear this uniform. So they're mostly these great scientists, engineers, uh, mathematicians. They, they work on the environment. It's mostly a civilian organization. And these are wonderful civilians. Uh, I was the head of personnel before I took this job. And a lot of folks talk about uh, the 1.1 million soldiers that have deployed in the last dozen years. What they don't realize is we've had 30,000 civilians deploy, and 11,000 of those have been core employees. And if they weren't deployed, they were, they were providing great science and engineering to those that are. You know, Krell is a great example. I'm going to talk about some of the things that they're doing that are serving the warfighter. So, so this organization does a lot more than, than build things. Uh, and, uh, and we've got a great team, and it's mostly civilians. Um, okay, third greatest watershed, largest watershed in the world. What are the first and second one? Amazon, good. In the Congo. So, so why is ours so much better? <laughs> well, I just gave the answer right there. I didn't know you could read it. But it's, this largest, it's the largest navigable system. So that's one reason. We have 9,000 miles of navigable waterways. And guess what? It's right in the heart, the breadbasket of the country. This great agricultural land is tied to that waterway. It flows into a great port down there in New Orleans, and all kinds of minerals and other uh, products uh, flow up and down the Mississippi. So by virtue of just being born here and, and, and living on this land, we have a jewel. I mean, the country has this unbelievable jewel called the Mississippi watershed that economically drives this country. I wanted to show you a video that we put together because a lot of people, I think, don't know all of the benefits of the Mississippi watershed. And if you don't know, don't feel bad. I, I didn't know them all until till we put this video together. So, um, okay, I'm doing something wrong here. So I, I get... <coughs> I get help. I was supposed to just... Okay. You've gone past it. Okay. That's why geos need a lot of help, general officers. Can we turn it up? Is there a way to turn this up? There we go. I, I figured it out. Okay. I made it too big, though. Oh, there we go. Is there one?
Okay, so hopefully you, you learned something in there that you didn't know about our, our nation's water resources. So very important, and much of that water resource work that you saw there is tied to that third largest watershed in the world. Um, so, so the next thing I want to talk about is, is how are we doing in maintaining? Given that, that we, we are blessed as a country with such a great natural gift uh, by living here, and, and then look at the economy that we benefit from that. Uh, when I think of infrastructure repair, uh, one of the things, uh, you know, the president would often talk about infrastructure, and, and he'd, he'd say the things that people relate to, roads, bridges, and schools. In fact, I was taking notes uh, at, the, at the State of the Union, or, or actually it was the Democratic National Convention, and I, I don't stay up at night watching those all the time, but I was really listening, and, and, and that's what was being said. So what we as a nation, and what the president talks about now is barge traffic in, in our ports, and in, in, in a lot of that has been engagement at every level to say, hey, our infrastructure is failing. Uh, our Corps of Engineers is responsible for $250 billion of infrastructure. $250 billion, and we cannot possibly maintain it. So the American Society of Civil Engineers goes out and they grade a lot of things. And I'm sure no one in this fine institution would like to take a grade home like this, but it's a D plus in dropping. Uh, not very good. What I'm going to talk about today. Uh, is disasters, but, but I, I want to talk about disasters, three major disasters, and how that ties into the fact that, that we need to do something about this problem as a nation. This is one of our grand challenges. There are no answers out there. Uh, uh, there's not enough money in the federal government, but, but we're going to have to figure this out. Uh, much of what we have today was started by FDR in the New Deal, where he wanted to put America to work. Um, and, and that infrastructure is aging. It's well beyond its 50-year design life that we designed it for. Average is 65 to 70 years old in many cases. We have some things that were built in the late, eight, late 1800s that we count on every day to make sure that this uh, waterway system works. So we have a huge challenge. Uh, we've got a lot of work that we need to do. Um, I want to give you an idea of what happens when we don't address these challenges. Now, this, some of this would have happened anyway. These, these natural disasters would have happened anyway, but, but could we have been better prepared by some of the work that we might have done? So uh, this is a story of three disasters. I'm going to talk about Katrina, the 2011 floods. Most of you probably don't know about the 2011 floods, uh, but, so that's a different story, but it's a good story, and I'm going to talk about it, but some were impacted, and certainly all of you heard about uh, Superstorm Sandy. Um, so, so this was the headlines in 2005. Um, we lost a lot of lives. We had a Category 5 storm coming uh, on shore. It finally hit at, at, at a Category 3. One of the things we in the Corps, uh, we, we don't focus much on the category of the storm. We, we kind of like to know what it is, but it's really the storm surge. It's how high is that wave, which is not measured by wind speed of the category. It's how high is that wave when it comes in that's going to impact on the projects that, that we have built. So... Um, let me, before I, I, I go to that, let me, let me talk about Hurricane uh, Katrina and, and before I talk about the work that we did. Um, Hurricane Katrina uh, in the hit in 2005, we were directed by Congress, uh, authorized and appropriated to start doing work to build a protection system uh, to protect the folks in New Orleans should a large storm come ashore. That was in 1965. Um, when it hit in 2005, percentage-wise, how far do you think we were? How much of that do you think we had completed? Anybody? 25, I heard, 25 percent? 100 percent? We got the range. Any, any, any other guesses? <laughs> it was 50 percent complete. It was 50 years, 50 percent complete. Um, you may, ask, you may ask, why is that? Well, um, a lot of it has to do with resources, a lot, to do, a lot to do with money. So Congress, today I have $60 billion worth of work to do that Congress has said, 
Corps of Engineers, you will go out and you'll execute this work. They give me two billion dollars in which to do it with. So, so you know, you like peanut butter and peanut butter sandwich. You, you spread that money like peanut butter all across the country. You start running out, and uh, and somebody's got to set priorities. We're, you, you know, but no one likes to set priorities because. You know, the priority, if you're a, a, a senator or you're a congressman, your priority is to your constituents. You want to do what they voted you for. And this is the greatest country in the world. I love our, our, our Congress and our democracy. But this is kind of how we're designed. So they're each fighting for what they believe is right. Uh, but what happens is when there's a disaster of enormous proportion, we respond better than any other country in the world. We are going to come to the aid of those in need and we're going to put the money down that's necessary in order to fix the problem. So uh, this is what we did. We, we, this is, uh, up, up here is a storm surge, or the, the Western uh, Gate Complex. This is the world's largest uh, pump station in the world. The world's largest pump station. This is the world's largest surge barrier, 1.8 miles, 26 feet from the water here up and, and, and buried down 144 feet to keep it stable. Um, and, and, then, and then the whole perimeter system, uh, uh, and I'll show you what this, this perimeter wall looks like, and it's right there. You know, so we went from this, protecting against a 30-foot surge, 25 to 30-foot surge, which obviously went over the top of that. Now, she's kind of short, but, but still, this is, the, 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 you can see, this is significant, a significant change in our design, and, and all of that cost $14.5 billion. Now, $14.5 billion sounds like a lot of money, right? It is. How much do you think we invested as a nation post-Hurricane Katrina? It was $130 billion. So, so the nation put $130 billion after Katrina, $14.5 billion came to the Corps of Engineers to build this. So the moral of the story, if any time during that 50 years you could have had the foresight or said we're going to prioritize in this area $14.5 billion, you'd have saved you know, $115 billion. That, that's kind of like the holy grail. How do, you, how do you figure that out? And how do you as a nation say this is our priority before the disaster strikes? Uh, we have a tough time with that. Um, Again, uh, we design against a 100-year storm. You can see the 100-year storm, the 500-year storm, the Katrina-level storm, 25 to 30 feet, and then the top of the current flood wall that's there. So a tremendous, tremendous amount of work that the American public decided they were going to invest into an area because we had lost a lot of lives and we suffered um, as a nation. How many are aware that we had a a flood of epic proportion in 2011, if you're honest. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I wasn't in the Corps then, but um, in 1927, uh, the country had a massive flood along the Mississippi, killed many people, uh, inundated uh, millions of lands, uh, acres of land. And, and the Congress and the American people said, we're going to build this Mississippi River's and tributary system. We're going to fund it. We're going to invest in it. And today, and that was in 1928 when we started, that work is about 90% complete today. And it withstood one of the greatest floods this country has ever seen. And no one knows about it. A lot of people don't know about it. Why is that? Because it worked. Yeah, it worked. No, no one died. I mean, it, it worked. So the system that our predecessors in 1928 designed as scientists and engineers to say what's going to happen in the future that, that our, our, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren are going to have to face. They had the foresight as engineers to, to build this. And, um, uh, and again, this is what happened in 1927. Uh, we, I want to show you the before and after. If you look in the, uh, the blue is how much flooding we had in 1927. And we, we ended up losing a lot of lives. We built levees, and then we built control structures that would uh, control the river where we wanted it to, but allow the river to flow and expand in areas where we projected uh, flooding. So, um, so one of uh, the two-star generals in my command had the decision to really blow up one of the levees 
And when he blew that levee up, we knew it would go into this farmland. But that was planned by, uh, by the folks that went well before us in the early 1920s. So this is a good news story where we had the foresight. We said, let's invest the money. Bad things have happened to us. We don't want it to happen again. And then we had Superstorm Sandy. Um, two days ago, a year from now, I was in the middle of a lot of bad stuff. I mean, and I was getting screamed at and yelled at, and it was, it was not pretty. Uh, we, we had our team up in New York, and, and we were fighting the good fight. And I think, again, the country responded in a way that I, I think is the envy of the world. Uh, I mean, when, when we have an, a, a problem, this country rallies and, and, and invests the money in the people and the talent and the leadership. And I think what, I, and I've seen a lot of these disasters, been a lot involved in a lot of them. I think this is one that we, we uh, as a country, responded to as well as I've ever seen us. Uh, starting with the president and, and the governors and, and Mayor Bloomberg uh, in the city of Manhattan and all the other mayors, they came together, and the first thing I think they demonstrated is leadership and, and guidance and direction and, and telling folks uh, what we had to do and, and how quickly we wanted things done. And uh, this was, uh, like I say, New York City had never seen anything like this. This is the Brooklyn Battery uh, uh, underpass. So the underpass is right, for those that know this area, uh, the underpass is right here. This is the top of the underpass. So there's a ramp that goes down here. And this was filled, filled with uh, the, the water. We had a 13-foot surge that came into the city. And we weren't really prepared for that as a nation, as a city. Um, we filled the Washington, uh, the World Trade Center you know, was filled. The, the Hoboken, uh, the, the terminal that goes to Hoboken, that was filled. The Hoboken terminal was, was damaged. Uh, the Amtrak and the subway, there was 475 million gallons of water that had to be removed. The longest vehicular tunnel uh, in, in the world, or the no North America, was filled with 85 million gallons of water. In fact, uh, the Corps had not done a mission like that before, and uh, we weren't sure who was going to do the mission, so there was a group of us trying to figure out who was going to take this on. And everybody backed up except us. You know, so, so uh, in fact, we didn't have the pumps in order to, to do this. Uh, we, we needed high head pumps uh, for this vehicular tunnel because we had to start at about 150 feet and, and push, pull water all the way up. We needed these high head pumps. And it wasn't for the Coast Guard, I think the United States Navy and the Mass Transit Association of New York City. I don't know that we'd ever gotten this done. But folks predicted it'd take two months or so to empty this water. It took us nine days working together as a team, and we got traffic up and running. Um, the um, 85 million gallons, as you see, is enough to fill the Rolls Bowl, but it was a real team effort, uh, working really hard. Our missions included temporary power. We had to provide power to nursing homes, to uh, uh, apartment complexes. We had never provided power to apartment complexes before because a, a city like this had never been flooded to this level. Our experience was in uh, places like Katrina, places on the Gulf Coast and in Florida. Um, in, in fact, they're, they're much better equipped to, to handle a flood than we found uh, in, in New York City. A lot of debris, uh, a lot of over 400,000 uh, tons of debris that, that was removed. So, so uh, a great tribute. To, I think the, the, the nation can be very proud of what, what they did, but this was expensive as well. And, and going forward, we really have to decide what it is we, we would like to do. Um, this is hard to read, these names and things, but it, that part's not important. I think what's important as you look at this is this New Jersey coastline. We flew some of this with uh, uh, Governor Christie, and, uh, and he was kind of pointing his finger in our chest uh, about concerns as he looked at places like this in 30 miles up or down the the beach line, he saw places like this with no impact. And we showed him this map. And uh, this map, we said, okay, uh, these yellow areas are, well, first, all these areas except for the blue are authorized. Their Congress has told us to do this based on, you know, legislation. Um, the areas in yellow were appropriated. We actually got some money to do something with. 
and we built projects. And projects, you can see, is not a lot. It's, it's this beach, which goes very far out, and beach uh, takes some of the steam out of something like Sandy. And it's dunes, and some of these dunes have been knocked down, but those dunes helped to take some of the steam out of Sandy. And, and then you had homes that survived. You had towns and cities that survived. And in places like this, uh, all along the coast, uh, not very far, you had complete devastation. So, so uh, in, in this, I'm going to just read a quote here from Governor Christie. He, he said um, this publicly while he was on the Jersey Shore. The towns that had significant engineer dune systems suffered significantly less than the ones that had no dunes. So we know that these dune systems now work. So really, uh, they're the difference between catastrophic damage and little or no damage. So after that, uh, he said, so how do I, I, I get my money for this? And I said, well, you know, uh, Governor, I, I don't know how you get your money. You know, you're going to have to get it from Congress. But, you know, after Hurricane Katrina, uh, they got, uh, you know, $130 billion. And, and he started going on a ramp. I want my Hurricane Katrina money. And, uh, and they got $60 billion, so $60 billion. And we, it would, and we got $5 billion. So $5 billion will do all the work that we need to do. But it's the same sort of math that I gave you earlier. So, so again, this is challenging. Do we want to invest early? Can we find the place that we should invest early? Can we get agreement across the country between different uh, parties and different uh, states and different counties that this should be the priority and this is where we should focus? That, that's the challenge that, that we face. We can, we can do the work. This is another place in New Jersey that shows you how we can do the work. If you look up here, this is pre-Sandy. This is a barrier island. Now, barrier islands help to slow down the, the brunt of the storm. They, they were, they're designed and they really help us do that. Now, if you're living on that barrier island, you're going to help slow down the brunt of the storm. <laughs> you know, uh, and, that, that, and that's what happened here. You know, the storm came through and just cut this barrier island in half. Just cut it in half, took this bridge down. And, and look at these dates. This is 30 October on, on 6 November. I mean, we, 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 we got this all built up. We, we've got the beach going back in. Uh, we put a pipeline down through here. And this is just not the core. It's a, it's a lot of America working together. We had help from all over America. But that's how fast we can work. There's a house still there, you know, right in the middle. Uh, we, we couldn't take it down. It, I don't think it's worth very much, but, but it's still right there. And, and you can see what this beach has. That, you know, the beach has to go way far out. But it's this kind of beach, that, that this beach re-nourishment that helps take the, 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 the real brunt of the storm as we move on. So the, the, the great news is we can do it. Um, some of the key lessons learned, uh, we, we've got to talk about the risk, and we've got to talk about it to people, and they have to decide whether they want to accept the risk. Do you want to live at Manilokan? Do you want to live uh, on a barrier island that you know is going to be one of the first places that storm is going to start to lose a bit of its steam? We know that we can build ecosystem and marshes in the water. So ecosystem restoration is really important uh, for the core and for the nation, that, that that kind of ecosystem that we're starting to lose is important that we start to gain some of that. And the dunes that you saw is some of the, 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 the kind of barriers that, that will help us. Structural things like you see here will make a difference. This is an elevated home. Um, and ultimately... Uh, you know, and the dean and I were talking about that. You, you may want to move. You know, that's a choice that you have to make. You, you may want to move. What's important for us to do is to tell you where the inundation can happen. Where could the flood happen? FEMA then decides whether, you know, that's an appropriate place where, you know, uh, you, you may or may not want to build. And it's our technical experts that help us do this kind of work. And I wanted to talk about people um, you know, there's a chief of staff of our army uh, long ago named Craig Abrams, and he used to say that soldiers are not in the army. And then he'd pause and he'd say, they are the army. They're everything about us. And I say that about our civilians as well. The civilians in the Corps of Engineers, they, they are the Corps of Engineers. They're the people you come in touch with. They're the people that design and engineer. Uh, they're, they're, this is Zoe. I talked to, to Zoe uh, Corville, and she's on her way to the South Pole, and it's a six-week trip, I think six-week trip there and back, and, uh, and I want, she wanted to be here, and she probably would have been here 
uh, had it not been for uh, the government shutdown and delaying her travels. But she, she's out there uh, in, in doing a, a very important mission of getting fuel out to the South Pole. Um, and when you think about whether you're, you're someone like Zoe or you're a civilian that's deployed um, in harm's way, and we've got a, about 700 civilians that are in Afghanistan from the Corps of Engineers now, or your civilian that's designing the flood inundation maps like Krell did uh, for New York to help convince the folks in New York that you, you probably ought to leave that area. Uh, the Corps and our people are making a difference. Uh, you, you probably caught on the video that uh, we have 370 million visits a year uh, to our, our recreation centers. And it's our park rangers here that are doing a lot of that, that work. Um, they're, they're in touch with more Americans than any other federal government organization in the world. Um, and, and probably, you know, I'm sure we beat Disney, you, you know, won't, you know, they, I think they get like 16 million visits, some say 20, but 370 million, but now they get more money out of those folks that visit, you know, we don't charge much, uh, you, you know, to visit the, the centers, but, you know, you see little children here, and, um, and the core reaches out because, uh, to STEM and, and schools, because we think it's important, I know that Krell's working with the middle schools and the high schools in this area, we think that's an immensely uh, important in what we do because we were the nation's engineers uh, at the beginning we still feel like we we have a responsibility as a federal agency that's focused on engineering to reach out and talk about the importance of science technology and engineering and math out of a hundred college graduates four are going to be engineers that puts us in the bottom 14 in the world uh, we used to be at the top in the 1980s we used to be at the very top so, so we're down there with Bangladesh Cuba Cambodia, th those are our partners in terms of producing uh, the kind of engineers that, that we need for this kind of, it's kind of just laughable but scary too. And then when you think about diversity, out of 100 uh, STEM graduates, 10 are going to be women, um, 5 are going to be African American, 5 are going to be Hispanic. Uh, you know, one of the things I talk about that, that, that I didn't realize when I left West Point, but you know, you know, I talked about West Point being this great engineering institution, still is, produces great engineers. Uh, one of the things uh, my boss told me, when I go over to the Corps of Engineer Engineers, you need to work on the diversity at the Corps. And I said, sure, yeah, I'll go over there and fix it right away. So I go over and uh, I, got, I got 29 general officers and I'm it. You know, it's like, there's one female and me. And I said, okay, how'd this all happen? You know, so I said, let me go back to look at graduation from West Point. When I graduated from West Point, what did it look like that? Well, at West Point, we had 100 cadets that selected the Corps of Engineers, and it was me. That was it. We, we didn't have women at the time, so, you know, it's just, just guys. And, and I said, okay, well, I planned on getting out after five years, so I guess good thing I stayed around a little bit longer. <laughs> I mean, uh, but... Uh, and then I, I said, okay, well, let me look at my brigade commanders. You know, this is the, neck, the colonels, the, the next level guys that are going to rise up into the ranks. And, and I've got 34 of those. Um, some of them are lieutenant colonels, but out of the colonels, the ones that are right below the generals, all Caucasian, all male. Okay? All right? So I, I'm not going to fix the diversity problem there. So, so then I asked for a list of the, the, the top 25 captains in the Army Corps of Engineers. And, and I was really eager, and I said, okay, generals, we're going to call these guys up. We're going to tell them to get their degrees. We're going to go to graduate school. I want them uh, to, to take fellowships. Like, I had the opportunity to get a fellowship, and they gave me this list of 25. There's one female on the list and one African-American. So that, that I was really disappointed and devastated, and I said, okay, well, I had to go up to West Point to welcome the new class of Corps of Engineers officers coming into the Corps. There were 127 of them and two African-Americans. So uh, some of my guys said I should be happy. We went 100% in 35 years. You know? <laughs> I said, yeah, you know, okay. So, so we got some work to do. I mean, so, so you see some young minorities here, women, African-American. It's important that we reach out as a nation. Uh, for the Army, it's important because we want to reflect America. Uh, we want to reflect America. We want to be as diverse as America is. We want to cover all race, religion, uh, every, every type of America. We want to represent America in our army. And it's important that we, we do that. But, but we have an uphill battle. So right now, you know, we pick generals after about 25 years. So you figure we're going to graduate. You know, we just brought in the class of 
of, uh, you, you, know, you know, the next class that's going to graduate is 20, 2013, 2014, so you add 25, 30 years to that. We're looking 2040, something, 2042, 2043. I, I can start working on that. You, you know, that's kind of scary. So, so that's why every day that you have an opportunity to do something to help in this area, it's important. And it's a big area for, for us in the core as well. Um, I want to talk about the, the value of research and development uh, in the Army. And again, the Dean and I had a chance to talk about this because we're worried about the future, at least from a military perspective, about our ability to invest in this area. I will tell you, first and foremost, this is a top priority to me. And, and I, everywhere I go, I talk about our Engineering Research and Dev uh, uh, Des Development Center, or ERDIC, and, and what they do for, the, for this country. Um, they, they, which includes Searle, are some of the foremost experts and scientists in the world, in my view, and they are le on the leading edge of a lot of this research uh, and development and technology that we've seen. I already talked about some of the work that they did for Hurricane Sandy. A lot of the modeling that goes on that we learned in Hurricane Katrina and we learned in Sandy is being done uh, within the Corps of Engineers. We're working with our academic institutions, our partners, but a lot of great work. Up here, I learned something I didn't know, uh, which is, happens every day, but, but uh, Corell is working on explosive residue uh, in, in the analysis uh, of that uh, residue and what the impacts are in the places we train so that we can ensure that from an environmental aspect we're not damaging the environment such that we can't train. Uh, Mark just came from Alaska as a, a battalion commander and his training had to cease because of the work, uh, because of the damage that was being caused and it was because of the folks at Krell that helped get that training back on and if that training doesn't go on then folks like Mark cannot deploy. Now something I want to point out about Mark, I don't want to embarrass him, but he's a wounded warrior. He, you, you know, you can't see it all there, but, but he was wounded pretty heavily in, in Afghanistan with an IED uh, attack. And, and uh, one of the things that we in the Corps of Engineers are focused on is bringing our wounded warriors uh, back into the organization, uh, making, giving them the opportunity to continue to excel. And those that have to leave the Army, we want them to move on to education and opportunities uh, to start another career. And, and so I would encourage you, and I know there there's an ROTC detachment here, and there are people, uh, the Air Force, uh, former Air Force there, so I really appreciate you bringing in veterans to come in uh, to the academic program here because I think they add to that diversity. Uh, there are many people that don't know a soldier or airman or Marine or na mid uh, Navy. I almost said midshipman. I really don't like the midshipmen when they keep beating us at football. So, uh, but uh, any of you guys that are Navy, but, uh, but on the battlefield, they're great. But, but it's important, I think, for the academic institutions to bring in uh, the, these service members because they, great, uh, they offer great insight to, to what uh, our nation is going through. Um, the, the, the core map is a, a map that helps us with uh, information systems and flood analysis. Uh, this other thing that, that, uh, that uh, Searle is working on is the snowpack, and this is Afghanistan, and showing you through the months uh, when they can expect a, a problem based on, on the hydrology, the water that they can expect for their crops and, and, and how much water uh, they may have from the snowpack. So, so a lot of great work. That, that Krell is involved in that's making a difference for the nation. Um, I, I'm going to finish up here on this. i got probably one or two more slides that I want to talk about. But, but I, I think history is a great uh, learning point for all of us as we go forward, especially you who are looking at the future uh, in research and development, to, to look back and, and look at this slide and, and kind of say, where have we come since... We first uh, started with our Constitution um, in, in the Corps' first responsibility in 1812 to build uh, ports on our coastal fortifications like Fort McHenry. Um, the, the, 12, the, the 1927 floods we talked about, uh, the Corps was involved in mapping the West and the Pacific Railway and helping the country uh, find California and, and Portland and those, those areas. Um, we talked about FDR and all the work that he did in setting a, his sights on the future and what had to be done. 
Eisenhower then came in with the interstate railway or the interstate uh, highways that, that we had to connect all of the states together, improve our commerce, our transportation, and our economy. Uh, the, the Florida Everglades, I talk about that because in, in the 70s when the National Environmental uh, Protection Act, NEPA, was passed, that got us focused on the environment a lot more than we are today. When I had the XO to the chief engineer job, I had this job that Mark's got. And um, we went down to Florida, I remember, and, and we, were, we were straightening out the Kissimmee River because it was better for the river to be straight. And we were straightening it with concrete. So it was this concrete uh, river. And, and today, we're, we're now putting the bends back in the river because, <laughs> you, you know, because it's more important for the environment and that, echo, that restoration and all the other benefits. Uh, I was just talking to the mayor of L.A. Uh, he's got, I don't know if you're, anybody, anybody from L.A.? But out in L.A., they've got the L.A. River. It's, it's all concrete. And, uh, and they're trying to take that out now, and they're working with the core. Can we fix what we built? Uh, and what I always tell folks is the core doesn't just come up with these great ideas. I mean, Congress passes a law and says, you will do this, Corps of Engineers. And, and that's, that's an, uh, an authorization. And then they pass another law that's called an appropriation. Here's the money to do it with. So, so when we built that concrete river, L.A. River, I mean, that's what the nation wanted. That's what the city of Los Angeles wanted. And now they're realizing, because of the same sort of environmental things, that, that hey, this, this didn't work, and times have changed, and we've got to be flexible and adaptable with that change. Hurricane Katrina told us a lot after that. So I put a big question mark. Um, you know, what's the future hold, and, and who's going to help us go into that future? So if you have a chief of engineers here 50 years from now, and he's talking to a group of students that are thinking about the future and where we're going to go, who's going to lead that effort? And, and, and what's going to be designed to help uh, people like the president and, and others envision what could be? Because a lot of the things that we built under FDR, we, I didn't, they didn't know that this was going to last as long as it would. They didn't know the Mississippi Rivers and Tributary System, the engineers and scientists, knew they had to protect against this, but they didn't know a flood would happen in 2011 uh, that, that we, they would have to design to accept. Um, so that's what you all are doing, and I, and I think that's what you do with, with, with Krell and other organizations like it uh, and other institutions, that, that this partnership of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers our military in education, like Francis Hesselbein had said, that this, this is the institutions that have sustained our democracy and our freedom. And we're kind of all in it together. And from my vantage point, the kind of things that Krell can offer, the kind of things that the Corps can offer, and the ways that we can work together, we're, we're all in. And, and we want to support, we want to work, we want to find the answers so that, that, that we can be proud in our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, and others can look back and say, hey, during that time frame, uh, they came up with some real uh, creative, innovative uh, designs and in, that, that have stood the test of time and have made this country better. So with that, uh, I'm going to take some questions and try to answer a few if you, if you would like. Yes. Yes. So, um, so how long do you give the Act of Alliance to take over the Mississippi? I remember a number of people back in time. How long do... For the Act of Alliance to take over the Mississippi? The Act of Alliance... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, just waiting, he's just waiting to take over, right? Right. I remember reading the Steve book. Yeah. Maybe 20 years ago. Well, you know, these are all estimates, so, you know, I don't know. Um, I... You know, we take our best scientists and engineers, and, and we do the best estimates that we can give. But but they are they are all estimates. I don't think. And the, and the guesses are. I, I don't know. I, does anybody from Krell know the answer to this? I I really you know that specific one I can't I can't answer. But if you leave your name, I'll I'll, I'll find it and I'll email it to you. How's that? So uh, hi. Uh, hi, Kate. Kate. Okay. 
Okay. It's Friday afternoon, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Uh, in, your, uh, in the abstract to your talk, you mentioned an era that you describe as the golden age of infrastructure. Uh, in your presentation, uh, you were somewhat pessimistic in uh, some cases about the likelihood of funding the projects that need to be done. Uh, you talked about having to prioritize. Uh, it looks like we are in an era of uh, tight funding, um, mostly due to a lack of willingness to pay for what we need to pay for, I guess, as a country. Do you see that changing anytime soon? Yeah, I, I didn't mean to come across as pessimistic if I, if I did. I, I'm actually, I think during times of crisis, there's always a silver lining, and if you want to change the way we do business, it's, it's during that crisis that, that you have that opportunity. Um, we've gone through that just with, with the war. I mean, the, our process for delivering a vehicle uh, to a soldier takes over a decade. Um, when that young soldier was sitting in Kuwait uh, getting ready to go up in Iraq and the Secretary of Defense um, was asked the question, why do we have this hillbilly armor that we're welding on our plastic doors in order to go into combat? And the SECDEF said, you, you, you know, you go, go to war with the, war, the army you have, not the army you wish you have. And the industry responded in an unbelievable way. And, and then we changed our business processes in acquisition that allowed us to, to do the kind of things that the, the country needed. And we took risks that we do, would not normally take. So, so I, I think we're at a point now. Uh, the other day, the House passed their version of the Water Bill, the Water Resources and Reform Act Bill, which, which really sets, helps us set the authorizations for infrastructure work. It passed 417 to 3. I don't know if people were aware of that, but this is, you, you, you know how bipartisan things are today. It, I've been in Washington all my life, and, and this is as bad as I've ever seen it. But 417 to 3 on infrastructure. So, so, so right now, and, and that's what I think, the country is at a tipping point where they, they, they know we have to do something. So, so I, I think if we can get everybody to rally around what it is that we, we agree on, and what, what should those priorities be, and what should we as a federal government do. And the federal government can only do so much, so, so we're really going to need the private sector, and the private sector is interested in participating. We just haven't made it simple for them. We've made it too hard. So, so, so we've got to find a way to simplify I was talking to a group of CEOs last week. One CEO said, hey, I've done 600-plus public-private partnerships all across the world, five in the U.S., you know, because you make it too hard. So, so, so we've got to find a way at this time, and I think we've got the right leadership in Congress, and we have bipartisan support that we might be able to figure it out now. And if we don't, then it's just going to continue to get worse. But, but I am optimistic that, that we're on the precipice of doing something good for the country. Yes, here and then here, up here. Um, so you've, you've done a, a nice, uh, you've made it very understandable how the kind of political system is connected to this And what I'm, what I'm wondering is where you see the, your organization being on the side, the kind of side of influencing the political decisions. So at, from one perspective, you, you set it up, it's like, okay, so the politicians are going to figure out what needs to be done, and then they'll tell you to do it, and then they'll figure out how to pay for it, and then they'll pass on the money. But, but how much of the kind of stepping before that point, how does that balance, how does that balance there? Like how is the, the, the decision-making process happening? Yeah. How does that relate to the core dealing with the American populace as well, yeah. as, well as leaders? Right, right. That's a, a, an excellent question. Um, what um, I see our role more as an integrator. We, we can bring the parties together because a lot of folks rely on the core for a lot of different things, whether you're an environmentalist, uh, whether you're non-environmentalist, whether you're business and industry or government, your state or local they rely on the Corps of Engineers to kind of bring the team together. So, so we, that, that's one thing that, that we can reach out and we can proactively bring the team together and force milestones and decisions to be made. So, so we're trying to do that, and whether it's Congress, OMB, and, and bringing those teams together. I see that as my responsibility, and we're pushing really hard on that. 
The other thing is we, we are the scientists and the engineers. We can, we can show you what will happen. Um, so, so with the ports, for example, uh, we were concerned about, and I spoke about this at lunch a little bit, but uh, when Panama, the, the work on the Panama Canal is done, these post-Panamax ships, these huge ships are going to come out of um, the, the Panama Canal, and they're not going to be able to get into our ports. Uh, and we're going to lose a lot of revenue, and, and our economy is going to suffer. So, so we were able to do a port strategy study. And we said, you know, let, let's do a port study of the East Coast and, and help uh, talk about what has to be done, present some options on what can be done, and then give that to the OMB and the political leaders to start a dialogue. So in August of 2012, the president came up with a we-can't-wait strategy. And on that weak hate white strategy, which partly was tied to the work that the core did with industry and other academic institutions, he said, okay, the priorities are New York, New Jersey, um, uh, Charleston, Savannah, Jacksonville, and Miami. That's what the core, uh, that's what the country is going to prioritize. Uh, we have 700 harbors and ports in the country. So, so for somebody to say that's the priority, that is a great first step. Now, we haven't gotten to the second step where we tie resources to those priorities. You know, priorities without, you know, resources don't really matter. I mean, it, it, it's good, but, but you've got to get the resource. So we're not there yet, but, but we are getting closer. So, so that's what we have to force the dialogue with the science and engineering that demonstrates and gives options to our, our leaders. Sir. We're really trying to help lead in this uh, renewable energy area. We um, last year released a, a seven billion dollar multiple award task order, which is, you know, we've got seven billion dollars worth of capacity to, to bring industry in to help us determine how do we best uh, use solar, biomass, geothermal, uh, wind, and, and other means of uh, renewable energy. On, first on our installations, but then also on our projects. So. So I think we are very interested in this. It's an area of high focus and importance to the Corps and the Army. Okay, here. Looks like I'm getting the hook, so uh, do we need to make this the last one? Uh, one more question. There, there was, yeah, yeah. I'd love to stay, you know. <laughs> but, Yeah, I, you know, I'd, I'd have a tough time telling you what the percentage is. Um, this is another one I can, it's, it's small. It's not, it's not as big as it should be. But when you look at projects that we're doing, like, like I, I signed a, a chief's report, um, the Savannah Harbor uh, chief's report, and, and I have to sign a report that 
tells Congress this is a project worth doing. And, um, and we sent that project up, and I was surprised that uh, almost 50 percent of that project is on environmental remediation and restoration, ecosystem restoration. So, so it's a huge part of every project. I, I think if you try to take individual projects and say how many are focused, those are a smaller number. The first chief's report I did was on that uh, surge barrier, and it was for the Bear Terrier Basin, which was the ecosystem that is the, in the marshland that we were trying to rebuild in, in the bay there. So it's very important for us. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Is this mine? No, that's okay. I hope you'll make it in time. Yeah. Uh, turn off the and I, I guess you were the one who responded to my email. Yes, sir. All right, well, I thank you for making this. Thank you.